Dr. Stephen Schaeffer, who is a chief scientist officer for the Soil Health Institute. And um, I must say that Dr. Schaeffer, before, before he joined the Soil Health Institute, uh, he was for 32 years working at USDA. And I'm not going to tell you more about that because he's going to talk to you more about the Soil Health Institute, the mission, goals, scientific priority, and partnership. Thank you, Chantal, and thank you uh, to the organizers for allowing me to come and tell you a little bit about the Soil Health Institute. I think the papers that have been presented uh, several times today by Dr. Lal and by Dr. Amel uh, really set the, set the stage very well for this. I have to say that in terms of uh, emerging technologies, I don't know that I'm going to tell you anything about any uh, brand new emerging technologies other than uh, perhaps uh, a new approach to community building and uh, collaboration, uh, uh, routes to collaboration and ways to uh, advance this, uh, this concept of soil health into, uh, into something that's actually uh, actionable. Now let's see, I'm going to try to see if I can interpret icons, yes. So, Dr. Law this morning uh, really laid out uh, uh, an amazing array of challenges and opportunities that we have in this field and he, he also reiterated some of that uh, here uh, today. Uh, you can certainly uh, uh, find this in many places. If you'll watch this map a minute, you'll see that it's, it's animated. And what it's showing you is over the uh, 25 years from the, from the uh, early 80s till 2007, um, the increase in urbanization and land use uh, and how it's encroaching on agricultural areas. So as you, you can pick your favorite part of the United States or your favorite community and watch it, and you can see what's happening to the land and that uh, this, this, uh, there, there isn't a lot of new agriculture agricultural land being created, let's put it that way, and it, uh, it continues to uh, have competition for how we're going to use this land. Uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency recently did, uh, did an assessment on the uh, condition of national rivers and streams, and the bottom line was more than half of them are considered to be in poor condition. Um, and the greatest stressors are, as, as we have seen over and over here, nutrient loading, uh, the disturbance and reduction of riparian uh, uh, buffers and, and cover, uh, sedimentation, and uh, shockingly, uh, 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 entero, en, enterobacteria uh, that, uh, that come from manure and, and uh, human waste. So uh, a tremendous, uh, a tremendous uh, impairment of resources nationally. And you can see this uh, uh, from uh, space, you can see the, the uh, with remote sensing, you can see where the nutrients, that's, uh, that's the, uh, the up, upper left there is, uh, is uh, that's okay, don't worry about it, Lake, Lake Erie, and you can see where all the nutrients are, oh, that's that one, okay, where all the nutrients are coming in, I was afraid I was going to zap somebody, okay, I've got my lightsaber going here. So uh, nutrients coming into the uh, uh, western part of Lake Erie, you can see the algal blooms here, uh, modeling where these nutrients come from and where they go. Uh, this is, this is uh, where an awful lot of this uh, comes from. Um, and we know what happens when the uh, soil surface isn't managed properly. You see after about a two inch rain, something that looks like this, tremendous erosion, tremendous loss of, of, uh, of resources. Um, and things that we can do, and a lot of these uh, we've, we've seen before. So they're key practices, such as, such as the use of uh, cover crops and, and planting the crops there. And in contrast to the slide that I showed just a, minute, uh, just a few seconds ago, uh, look, at the, look at the water flowing through this field, completely different. Uh, and in fact, if you go in even closer, you see that in contrast to that field, the other field, um, it's, it's really quite, quite clear and clean, and the capture of sediment and the capture of nutrients is, uh, is, is quite evident. If you don't believe your own eyes, you can look at the data. And uh, this is a summary of a number of different uh, studies that have been done in, in a, a wide variety of locations in the United States and also one in Europe, showing different kinds of cover, cover crops and look at, looking at the uh, reduction in nitrate leaching that, that happens, it ranging from 13, a low of 13% here to as much as 94% in Kentucky almost eliminating it in, in that particular site. So this idea of using cover crops, this is, a, this is something that uh, 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 is known. We can, we can apply this. It's, uh, it's uh, an application that we can actually uh, make use of. 
If you actually go even further, there's a meta-analysis been done uh, that showed that uh, uh, with 69 studies, on the average, cover crops reduced nitrate leaching losses by 70%. So uh, in the sense that, um, you know, knowing how to uh, approach some of these problems, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work been done, and uh, if we'll apply, the, uh, apply the, the knowledge, we can make some headway. Another aspect, and uh, Ratan has mentioned this several times, and that is the, the, uh, the aspect of climate change. And this, this uh, map shows the United States, and it's a, pro it's a model uh, that projects uh, the increase in number of months of, uh, of drought over the next 30 years. So the redder it is, this is more than what we have now, the number of months, uh, the redder it is, 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 uh, is even more months over the next 30 years that will, that will have drought. And you can look at that in very important agricultural part, uh, regions of the United States. We can deal with this, we can't make it rain more, but we can deal with this in some ways. And this illustrates the point. Uh, by going completely black. Oh, there it went. Okay. Uh, it shows that uh, in a sand, at least, uh, uh, FC represents field capacity, the amount of water that's held against gravity. Uh, PWP is permanent wilting point. And it, as this graph shows, that gap between those two, which is the available water holding capacity, increases with increasing soil carbon content. And so the more carbon we can put in the soil, the wider that becomes, and uh, the greater water holding capacity that the soil has, and basically, stores more water. Uh, you can see how this can be done. This is uh, several different pasture, uh, pasture measurements, uh, Bermuda grass, uh, tall fescue, and, and some cropland, and it tells the story. With increasing uh, soil carbon, the bulk density of the soil decreases. It becomes more uh, crumbly and a lot more pore structure. That's what holds the, the water against gravity, and uh, the, the greater the amount of carbon and the lower the bulk density, the better off we are with respect to uh, holding, holding on to, to water. Uh, other practices that can accomplish some of this, again, no-till. Uh, uh, we've heard, uh, heard this mentioned before. No-till is a common practice. Again, you can, you can see the influence of this, two fields side by side with a fence running down the side. Left is uh, no-till and the, the right is not. And uh, uh, you can see that after a good rain, the amount of water that's still standing and, and then later will run off in the uh, field on the right, whereas the field on the left you can see is uh, much greater infiltration and holding onto the, to the water. Again, if you don't believe your eyes, look at the data. Uh, four different states, the number of years that uh, have been in uh, con conventional tillage and no tillage, and you can see again uh, the uh, amount of soil organic carbon that is retained under the no-till, even after a relatively few number of years. Uh, in Kentucky, 45% versus 52, 53%, uh, another 5% increase in Illinois. Uh, those, those are significant differences in terms of the function of the soil, and it doesn't take forever to get there. You can actually see uh, measurable differences after really just a handful of years. Looking at some further data on tillage and cover crop impacts, again, this is on water infiltration rate, how much water passes into the soil, and you can see that over a period of time in a number of different sites, uh, you, can, you can almost double, and in some cases more than double, the increase of, of water infiltration. And so again, uh, the point is uh, we can't make it rain more, but we can certainly, we can certainly make better use of the uh, water that we're getting. And Rattan, I think you, you showed this possibly, probably better than than this slide with your with your student standing in the field, uh, but this illustrates the same thing. Is in that 2002 or 2012 drought year, looking at uh, sites in the Midwest uh, that had cover crops and with and uh, didn't use cover crops, uh, those. Those um, locations, those farmers that used cover crops saw about a 10% increase in yield over those farmers that didn't use the cover crops. And again, this is very much related to uh, uh, water infiltration and, and nutrient retention. So again, we can't make it rain, but we can certainly, we can certainly make a difference with this. This is not just uh, 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 crop agriculture. Uh, the, the same principles hold up for animal agriculture. Uh, again, uh, two fields, uh, one on the left under more or less continuous grazing, uh, the one uh, on the right, uh, intermittent grazing, uh, less intensive grazing, and uh, again, uh, you can see on the left uh, a continuous grazing versus a rotational grazing on the right. Uh, this goes down to, 
uh, let's see, that's the two foot mark. And look at the difference between uh, the amount of carbon that's in the soil, how deep it is uh, as, the, as the plants are grazed in a rotational way, the roots die off, uh, then the plants are allowed to regenerate, and again, you get more cycles of, uh, of uh, root biomass and, and um, decomposition in the, in the soil. Again, just to look at some, some data on, uh, on grazing rates, uh, it turns out that in terms of both soil carbon and soil nitrogen, uh, no grazing and heavy grazing turn out to be about the same, but if you allow this light grazing or rotational grazing, allowing the plants to uh, regenerate and put more carbon back into the soil in the form of roots, uh, you can actually increase soil carbon and soil nitrogen above what was the background level uh, in terms of, of no grazing at all. Everybody grown. This is one of those slides that you have to, that, uh, uh, and, uh, that uh, it does no good to project it other than to uh, tell you that uh, I commend it to you. This is at the uh, Kadamba Foundation, um, which is a, a, a sustainable agriculture foundation in India. Um, I commend, that you, commend it to you to go and look at this and study it. It doesn't do you any good to, to, to do it but uh, right here. But I think it illustrates so much of what uh, Rattan was saying in, in, in his talk. The idea that putting uh, uh, n uh, plant and animal residues and waste back into the soil, primary effects, secondary effects, subsequent effects on the soil system, and ultimately environmental or ecosystem effects. Now the question is, from a scientific standpoint, is to what extent we can hang numbers on these different boxes and arrows and rates in a model such as this. And that's, that's a tremendous source of getting us to think about what are the research needs in this. Because as Rattan also pointed out, so much of this is context laden. Uh, it changes with generations. It certainly changes with uh, how we want to use the soil. Uh, a soil that's uh, used for blueberry production in Maine is not one that you want for uh, corn and soybean production in the Midwest. And so there's a lot of context to this, but to the extent that um, we can study this kind of a, of, a, of a conceptual model that relates all these things gives us clues to where the research uh, needs lie. So, soil health. Uh, Rattan, uh, you, you defined it nicely. This is a little bit shorter one to the capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And the point is this. Uh, we can talk about the quality of almost anything. Water, air, wine, the food we've had here. Uh, you can talk about the quality of it. Um, but if you're going to use the word health, it's got to be alive. <laughs> And uh, that's the emphasis on soil health, is on the living, the aspect of this is living and interacting with the uh, physical and chemical characteristics. And uh, as, uh, as has already been pointed out, it's not what is measurable that's there, but what is it doing and how can you, how can you uh, uh, measure that. So with all of that in background, uh, in 2013, the uh, Farm Foundation and the Noble Foundation, the two oldest agricultural research foundations in the United States, uh, started something called the Soil Renaissance. And this was the idea was to ad advance soil health and make soil health more prominent in decision making on, on any kind of land use decision. Uh, with the idea that there's lots of great work going on out there at universities and in government and, and all over the place, but um, it's not necessarily terribly well coordinated and it's not necessarily driving toward um, useful solutions. A lot of great science going on, but to what extent can we pull this together and, uh, uh, and, and use it to attack some of these problems that we've heard about? So they came up with a, 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 a program over several years of meetings and based it on four uh, what they call pillars, uh, research, measurement, economics, and, and education. So this was a short-term effort. It was supposed to last just a few years, but after about three years of it, um, they realized that these four pillars, they were generating a lot of good ideas and a, and a lot of priorities and thoughts for science and where to go with education and so forth, but there was no real implementation arm. There was no way to, uh, within the, the context of the soil renaissance, to actually push it forward. So someone like Dr. Law may attend the soil renaissance and then he might go home and say, well, I'm going to take some aspects of those ideas and work those into my research program, but as an overall coordinated effort, it needed an implementation arm. 
There's a lot of interest in this. You've heard about it over the last, uh, over the last day or two. Uh, a lot of other organizations are involved in this space. Uh, USDA, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the Phytobiome Initiative that's uh, across several uh, scientific societies, the conservation districts, state level organizations in the United States. But there, there is a need for an umbrella organization to focus all of those efforts and uh, foster an environment that includes everyone that has good ideas and get it to, get it to actually be implemented implemented. So hence, uh, the step forward was the creation of the Soil Health Institute, which has a mission to safeguard and enhance the vitality and productivity of the soil through science-based research and advancement. <clears throat> this is our vision. You can, you can read it for yourself, but uh, essentially what it says is the Institute wants to be a primary source of coordination and information to uh, uh, yield healthy, sustainable soils that provide these benefits. Uh, this is not an administrative meeting, so I'm not going to dwell on this, but uh, the, a couple of slides just to show you that the, from an operational structure, we're lean and mean. Uh, it was just created uh, uh, within the last six months, uh, actually in terms of hiring and so forth. Um, <clears throat> you see the chief scientific officer on the far left, that's me. The president and the CEO sits on the board, and these other, these other groups are actually staffed by people who have interest in this, scientific members of the scientific community, and, and growers, and uh, other kinds of, of experts and people with experience at this that will, will support the Institute and its activities. Um, in terms of our board, I don't want to, again, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but what I would say is the board uh, is about 20 people and is extremely diverse in terms of its interests and background. We have growers, we have representatives of scientific societies, we have uh, uh, policy people, we have a number of different science and technology groups, uh, we have organic uh, producers, we have conventional producers. It's a, it's a great board um, and uh, they, uh, they provide a, a lot of input and, and we're, it's, it's, it, they're great to work with. Uh, Bill Buckner is the board chair, he's the uh, president and CEO of the Noble Foundation. So the four institutional pillars. First off, we've got the research. The whole idea of this uh, within the institute is to help identify gaps. Lots of research going on, but are there gaps? And can we organize this and uh, uh, construct roadmaps to get us there? Uh, we want to support peer-reviewed research. Um, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, we're going to try to support the full uh, spectrum of basic translational and applied work to get all the way to decision support. Um, we would like to be a, a global, have, have a, a global access to experts uh, around the world. We wanna, we wanna have the best people involved with this. And um, a, a very key goal is to actually deliver the information to the end users, people who will actually use this. We want the work to be actionable, that people can, can, can actually apply it. In terms of the research awards, we haven't started the program on this, but uh, we basically we expect to have two different kinds of research awards, one that are open solicitations that uh, are competitive, and, uh, but also uh, recognizing that there are, are people around who are doing uh, really uh, uh, very good work that we would like to see accelerated, uh, that we would like to support and see that, uh, see that that gets to applications faster, and so we'll have some of that as well. We'll be using scientific review panels and, and peer review uh, to, to manage all of that. So um, the, uh, uh, as broad, of, uh, broad as a portfolio as we can get it. Uh, we will base um, research on milestone accomplishments. Um, what is it that the pro, uh, person has proposed to actually do or accomplish in terms of applications or, or use towards applications and uh, uh, base our research on that. Uh, we want the uh, information and anything that's developed to be accessible. Uh, so we'll have a, an institute website and I'll, I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, we are going to favor open source publications where people can get at the information as quickly as possible and we will make allowances obviously for intellectual property for tech transfer using some models of some federal agencies in which uh, the uh, awardee institution actually owns the intellectual property, but licensing is used to accelerate getting, the, getting that uh, intellectual property into, into use. We've heard a lot about the importance of economic analyses, and that's another one of the pillars, one of the four pillars. And uh, we see um, little sense in uh, uh, doing a lot of science and technology development 
that uh, looks good in the scientific journals, uh, but that it doesn't make economic sense that a farmer, or, you know, a land manager wouldn't use it. So we need to bridge that gap um, so that we know the costs and benefits of some of these practices and demonstrate the economic feasibility to producer decisions. And so the economic analyses will go hand in hand with the research that uh, we'd like to support and um, uh, actually develop producer uh, decision tools that will be based in part on economic consideration so that uh, uh, not only are the practices there in terms of what they will accomplish, but also from the economic standpoint. Education and communication, uh, here again, you know, it doesn't do a lot of good to have all of this and not have people know about it. So um, we will um, make a concerted effort to make sure the information is known um, through our network of partners. Um, by now you should have realized that it won't be me wearing a light, white lab coat and doing this in the, in the lab, uh, that we'll have a lot of scientific partners and so we'll be, we're working with them to get the communications out and uh, developing a, a network there. Uh, policy, we do not intend to be a policy shop, but we do intend to make information available to policy makers and decision makers uh, based on soil health. We would like to think that um, when they make uh, policies and decisions, as Dr. Law pointed out, holding his pyramid together at the top, that these would be based on science, and uh, we're hoping that we would be the, the uh, one, one primary source of that, that kind of information. So we're looking for market-based solutions and uh, an overall approach to strengthen food security uh, international relations and food security, overall sustainability. One of the tools uh, that we've already started work on, working on, we've called a soil research landscape, and this is uh, the idea for this is to pull together information, um, uh, publications, and databases, and so forth into a single searchable source. Uh, so that will be accessible to the entire soil health community and, and frankly anybody uh, that's interested it'll be uh, online and uh, we're, uh, we intend to use this to help identify uh, where the gaps are in some, some aspects of soil health research. It's kind of in the beta testing uh, form right now. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an early look of what it will look like. It will be, uh, uh, the information there will be cross-referenced uh, for not only, but uh, the kinds of problems that uh, a land manager might have, what kind of indicators uh, or measurable aspects there might be, what kinds of actions what one might take, uh, the functions of the soil that we're talking about, and desired outcomes. And you'd, you'd be able to uh, uh, sort of slice and dice this as to the different pieces that you're interested in so that you can zero in on the, on the kind of, uh, of literature or uh, databases that you might be interested in. So for example, you could, you could enter this at any point and using the different pieces as filters, you could actually come down to specific pieces of information. Now, for copyright purposes, we can't put, put those, a lot of those articles on, online on our website, but we can, we can have our own summaries of this and uh, tell you what's in that, uh, what's in that uh, reference and uh, tell you what the lead institution was and who did it and, and what's, av what's available. So this is where we would accumulate not only literature that's recommended to us from the scientific community that needs to be on this soil health landscape tool, but also databases and data that, that are being generated through institute-supported uh, research. So just to sum up and, and wrap it up here, we've got uh, sort of the, uh, an approach to this. Uh, we want to quantify the, uh, the adoption and impact, and the way we get started with that is to have proper measurements and um, come to consensus on what those measurements are and how they should be done so that we can assess the current status of soil health in the United States and uh, uh, make a determination of the uh, uh, practices that are being used, and that becomes a baseline. And again, since we want all of this to be actionable, we have to have baselines. And so uh, coming to grips with how to, what to measure and how to measure it is something that uh, we would like to have leadership in, in terms of coordinating and, and uh, help, helping make that decision. Um, in terms of uh, then we, uh, what practices are being adopted, and uh, that will require some modeling in terms of uh, determining what the, what the adoption rate is and the, overall, and the large scale um, uh, impact of that is, and that will in turn require some ground truthing of the model prediction, so we'll need to seek out partners that are out there with boots on the ground, on the land. Those might involve the uh, discovery farms, the long-term agroecosystem research network of the USDA, uh, and others. 
And then finally, we want to promote the increased adoption of the soil health practices. Uh, this one includes uh, the quantifying the impacts on profitability and economic risk, the development of these decision support tools for producers, and again, partnership with, uh, with people, uh, boots on the ground organizations, the conservation districts, the land grant universities, and, and so forth, on workshops and demonstration and field days and, and webinars and so forth. So uh, if, you, if you haven't gotten the message yet, uh, my main message to you is we're looking for partners. We're looking for people who share our interests uh, of, uh, of, about soil health and where we feel uh, soil health needs to fit into land management thinking and uh, 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 not only in agriculture but all land management uh, uh, processes uh, and, and applications and uh, we invite your partnership. So I'll stop there. Thank you.